and roll to this box and SIS Pitches presents Building Sports Pitches, Key Considerations and Maximising Your Investment. This is actually the first instalment of our webinar series in 2021, so we hope you very much enjoy. We've had over 144 of you register to attend today, and it's amazing to see representation from over 75 of our member universities and also 18 other organisations. So thank you all for registering and welcome. Today we are joined by our new partner, SIS Pitches, who will bring with them years of experience and expertise in creating and maintaining outdoor sports surfaces. In today's session, you'll be hearing from a number of people. First of all, Joe, Joe Shaw, Sales Manager at SIS Pitches, who will be sharing how they can support you in maximising any investment into building sports pitches. We'll then be joined by Dan Tilly, Director of Sport at University of Nottingham, who will be sharing his experiences regarding the latest pitch upgrade at the David Ross Sports Village, including insight around the environmental considerations they considered as a part of the work. Mark Davis will then join uh, myself on screen for a bit of a Q&A. Mark is Head of Sports Infrastructure at Loughborough University and he will talk about how key decisions are made to consistently, consistently push forward facility development. And all of the above will then uh, join me right at the end to form a panel for some further Q&A at the end of the session. On that note, we've received a number of questions already. Thank you for those that submitted them during the registration. But please do feel free to submit further Q&A uh, questions do, using the Q&A function uh, as the presentations are progressing, please do indicate who you might like to answer those questions if you can. Now, before we start, before I hand over to Joe to kick us off, there's just a couple of housekeeping uh, things to note. Firstly, this webinar is being recorded, therefore it will be available for you to view again and you will be able to share it with your friends or colleagues afterwards. This webinar will be an hour and we will try our best to keep to that time. Uh, and please do share any insights you've learned from this on your social media platforms today. Our handle is at Booksport on all our social media platforms. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome Joe to the screen to get us started with the first presentation. Thanks, Jenny. Okay. So thanks, Jenny, and thanks to everyone for uh, tuning in. Um, just to give a bit of background on SIS pitches. Um, so we'll get started with um, what we do and how we do it. Um, then we'll go into our one-stop shop vision, um, as well as uh, various innovations. And then finally, how uh, you should view your project differently to get the maximum amount of uh, benefit from it. So to start off, I'll just have a quick video. SIS Pitches is the UK's largest one-stop shop for synthetic pitches. We manage the full process in-house, which gives you complete peace of mind from start to finish. Whether you are looking for a new pitch or a resurface, our experts can help you. All of our turf is produced at our UK factory, which is one of the most technologically advanced production facilities in Europe and offers a diverse range of products. We are specialists in synthetic pitch construction and all of our pitches are installed by our in-house, highly skilled workforce using the latest technology. We also have a dedicated in-house maintenance division that can build a completely bespoke maintenance package for your pitch to keep your pitch in the best condition for longer. For more information, contact us today. So as you can see, um, we are a one-stop shop. Um, we can take a project from uh, conception, uh, full circle, from an idea through to construction and then completion. Key points of this is that the complete process is undertaken in-house and in the UK, which is different to other um, models in the industry where traditionally a construction company has partnered with a synthetic turf manufacturer. So as you can see from the graphic, um, we can start you off from the design and planning phase through the manufacturing, which is done in our in-house facility in the UK, um, through to construction, installation, and then maintenance and aftercare. So all sports are covered, including football, rugby league, rugby union, hockey, tennis, golf, lacrosse, American football, cricket and athletics. And we provide uh, a number of turf systems, including natural turf, 
hybrid reinforced turf and synth fully synthetic systems. So th the key point is our focus is always on the client to provide the best possible service, the best possible client experience and interaction both sorry, before, during and after the project. So our end-to-end -end solution can give the maximum project quality and benefits long term. Just to give you an idea on um, some previous projects, so as you can see, um, some very high-end um, customers. Uh, the key ones on here um, is that Saracens Rugby Football Club, so they were the first in the UK to have a synthetic rugby pitch in the Premiership, and um, so we're pioneers on that front, as well as our Cisgrass, Cisgrass technology, which was utilised at the Luzhniki Stadium, as well as our Cisair innovations. So it's just to show that um, throughout the UK, our model has been uh, now worldwide and uh, for a variety of clients and for a variety of sports. So the key thing is we want to take you from start to finish, um, as well as providing maintenance after the fact. So CIS Plus is our bespoke, is our, sorry, is our internal maintenance division. Um, which can provide added value post completion of your works. We can offer bespoke packages to meet all budgetary and project requirements. And once we've completed your project, we'll sign you up to an online portal system so you can get expert advice and support whenever you need it. Again, our emphasis on building a relationship with you, the client, through constant communication and service uh, and key maintenance can extend your lifespan of your pitch a number of years uh, and which is required for such a significant investment. Within this maintenance package now we offer uh, CIS Cleanse which is in response to the recent uh, COVID uh, situation. Um, this is an antiviral antibacterial solution that is 100% safe um, and was developed to give peace of mind to um, both facility users and facility managers throughout the UK and has already been rolled out to a number of surfaces and as you can see there it's um, being used at uh, Allianz Park where Saracens Rugby Club play. Um, the idea on these new innovations is that we're flexible and move with the times uh, and make all the all of our surfaces as safe as possible, especially during these difficult moments. So innovations. Cis, the CIS group are at the forefront of um, innovative techniques in both not in both synthetic and hybrid um, areas. Uh, recent innovation include CISGRAS, which you can see our CISGRAS universal machine. This is the hybrid turf system where we stitch artificial fibres into natural grass. And this has been used extensively since 20, it was invented in 2015, stadium pitches, cricket wickets, golf centres, etc. Um, we've also created CIS Air, which I mentioned earlier, which is an undersoil heating system, which has been used in a number of projects throughout the UK and Europe. And also, we have had a CIS grade EPDM infill material, which provides an alternative to traditional rubber as an infill. Other things we're looking at as a company are working towards net zero carbon emissions, systematic tree planting to offset um, any carbon footprint we may have, uh, moving to electric machinery for maintenance and on site works as well as changing all our vehicle fleets to electric, providing a hierarchy of uh, re recycling options for new pitches, infill containment and design innovations, which are project specific and can be uh, determined by the client. As, and this has been our sort of, our um, commitment to this is shown by a recent 1.8 million pound investment in our manufacturing facility. So, looking at your project differently, 
number one is design. So what we're getting at here is know what you want. So when you're looking at resurfacing or refurbishing an existing pitch or looking at a completely new build pitch, think, right, how is this design going to get us the maximum benefit? So this might be on the type of sport. It might be how you manage the facility or who you're planning to let it out to. And the real question is, what do you want to achieve? It's a massive investment, so it could be used for up to 25, 30 years. And um, so you want to make sure that it's done correctly, the build itself, and if there's any resurfacing, that you get the right product. Then you get the maximum leg legacy benefits, and it can even fit it to design your university model. Number two is know your supplier. So what type of company will you be dealing with? Do your own research. Check similar projects, not ones that they've provided necessarily, but do your own research into what type of company they are. Look at their performance as a whole and treat any investment in sports facilities as a partnership as opposed to a transaction. So how can you get exactly what you would like for your uh, university or college and provide the best possible facility for the consumer. Moving on to number three, know your products. Is, your, is the product or the system you want, does it need to be elite? Does it need to be for community use or even for research purposes? Get up to date on your product terminology, find out what things mean. Specifications for these type of projects can be very complicated. So make sure you know what you're, talk, you're, you're looking for and you know what you're getting when it comes on site. This will help you market your facility and place your project within the overall campus footprint. And check warranties. A longer warranty doesn't necessarily mean a better surface. Read the small print and find out what's realistic and we can help with all those things. Number four, what we're really keen on it's communication. Speak to suppliers. Know the market. Maximise the benefit of your investment, with both before, well, before, during, and after. So engage with suppliers. Find out all about them. Um, this is probably any investment in sports facilities is extremely important in regard to the health, well-being, competitive sport, and revenue generation of the university. So any adjustments uh, that can be made through communication in order to enhance the project, innovate on site, any ideas you might have when the project's ongoing, you should let, let the supplier know and see what they can do for you. And finally, future proofing. Maintenance and aftercare. Is it in place for your project? Environmental innovations whether it be LED floodlighting, new drainage systems, different infills. All of this can help future-proof your um, investment. We're happy to discuss any potential innovation developments and tie into any future works on campus to make sure that yours, your project is the most economically beneficial and lasts as long as it possibly can. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Joe, for that insight, I guess, into the innovation driving, uh, being driven forward by SIS pitches. So thank you very much for that. Um, there's a couple of questions already popping up in the Q&A channel. So it's just a reminder to everyone, please continue to submit those. We'll try and do our best to cover off all of them during the Q&A at the end. But any we do miss, we will follow up um, with answers after the session today. So if there is anything you want to know, please do ask it. And one way or another, we will get an answer to you. So thanks again, Joe, for that. We'll see you again at the end. Um, I'd like to welcome now Dan Tilly, Director of Sport, University of Nottingham, uh, to talk about uh, some of his experiences over at the David Ross Sports Village. Thank you, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk from the perspective of a, a client um, about a resurface project that we've just about completed. So. Let me just move my slides on. There we go. So I'm going to talk about 
how we chose our surface, some of the environmental considerations we uh, thought about, and then some of the other design factors as well. Um, before I start, one health warning. Um, I'm conscious that a lot, of, a lot of you on this call are probably greater experts than I in this area. So really what I'm doing is, is just presenting my own personal opinion here. There's a lot of subjectivity in there. So please don't take what I say as gospel. Um, there are a lot of arguments out there, a lot of different perspectives. And I'm really just talking about the journey that we went on. So to start with, in terms of choosing a surface, um, let me give you a bit of background about our pitch. So we had a, a 3G pitch that reached the end of its life. Uh, to give you a sense of that, it was struggling to pass the IRB and the FIFA tests. And in fact, it, it took us three goes in, in one year just to pass those tests. So it was really, it really was uh, in need of replacement. Um, it was a fibrillated carpet built on a dynamic base with a prefabricated chop pad. And in terms of usage uh, at a peak time, it could have about 65 hours of use a week and off peak time, probably dropping around to about 35 hours a week. Um, it was designed initially for, for football and rugby, but I think over its lifespan, we've seen other sports um, grace the surface. So the likes of lacrosse, baseball, softball, American football, ultimate frisbee. Um, so we had to start thinking about those sports as part of the new design. Um, and as it was a resurface project, um, there weren't really any planning issues to consider in terms of noise and lighting, which obviously made it a bit more straightforward than those of you that might be considering um, a new build. So one of the first decisions we had to make was around the base. Did we want a dynamic base or an engineered base? Um, I think our view was that some of the problems we'd had in the past with it passing the, the different IRB and FIFA tests was, was probably due to the dynamic base. Um, so we opted for an engineered base, which, which is more expensive. Um, and, and it was interesting when we went out to tender that some of the companies we approached actually refused to lay on a dynamic base and insisted they would only lay on an engineered base, which perhaps reinforced our view about its, its reliability. Um, second decision we had was around the shop pad. Do we go for a prefabricated shop pad or an in situ shop pad? Um, we went for a prefabricated shop pad. Um, it's cheaper and it's more environmentally friendly. I, I think we felt the tolerances with it being factory produced were going to be better. Um, but it, it's worth flagging if, you, if you're thinking of laying a hockey pitch, you would probably go with an in situ um, shock pad um, just because the weight of the carpet for a hockey pitch is different and then in situ tends to suit that better rather than the prefabricated. So we then had to think about the carpet. Did we want a monofilament carpet, a fibrillated carpet or both? So the fibrillated is where the, the fibres break down over the lifespan of, of the carpet. Um, it tends to have a softer feel, it tends to keep the infilling better, but I think its performance over time um, tends to be um, uh, less sustainable really. I think the monofilament generally looks better um, and doesn't break down as much so it maintains the performance standards for longer. Um, the combined, um, so some companies um, offer both a carpet that has both fibrillated and monofilament to kind of maximize both those elements. So the fibrillated to keep the, uh, the rubber crumb in and then the kind of monofilament to stand up and, and make it look good. Um, I think we were just concerned about how that would look long term after seven, eight years, if you've got some fibers all bent over, others still standing up, would it look good? And there aren't any carpets that have been out there long enough. So we, we steered clear of that and just went for the, the monofilament option, which I think is, is probably got um, the major share of the market at the moment. We then started to look at that, that more detailed specification. Um, and and it, it's very easy to start to get bamboozled by a huge amount of data and, and marketing spin. Um, you can see on the slide reference to shark skin technology and patented tough guard technology and zero carbon carpets. Um, and it's understandable because different companies want to try and market their own, you know, USPs and try and stand out. Um, if you want simplicity, um, just go for the FIFA and the World Rugby Standards. Um, so find a manufacturer that basically is a FIFA preferred producer and a World Rugby preferred turf producer. That should give you a short list of about seven companies and give you a level of surety and, and you'll get a good product with that. However, you might want to delve a little bit deeper. Um, now, this slide might come up quite small on your screens. Apologies if it does, don't worry too much about the content. Um, this is just an example of one supplier who on their website offers eight different solutions 
for a 3G carpet. And, uh, you know, when I first looked at this, uh, trying to pick the difference between a carpet that's described as exceptional resilience, outstanding field coverage and great encapsulation versus one that says high resistance to wear, exceptional resilience and softness. I, I befuddled me, to be honest. Um, and I think it, it's really hard to try and navigate what these descriptors actually mean. Um, a good thing to look at is the data sheets. So if you look at the data sheets, they start to give you a bit more detail and they start to talk about things like pile weight, um, tufts, stitches, DTEX values. Um, again, th there's a level of um, understanding you need to get what these actually mean for you. Um, but they're, they're a good kind of middle ground to try and understand some of the differences between the carpets. And generally the kind of the higher value you get on that um, as a broad rule, the better carpet you're gonna get. If you want to go to the extreme, uh, you can ask for the, the lab tests. So there are lab tests that um, you have to, the companies have to pass to get their kind of fee for accreditation or their world rugby accreditation. Um, in my view, you probably need a degree in engineering to understand them. Um, they're quite complex, um, but if you can navigate that, then yeah, you'll get a really good understanding of, of the product that you're going for. So in terms of what we did, um, we basically picked out five key um, characteristics that we thought um, helped distinguish between the different carpets, largely because actually we could see significant variation between them when we looked at those data sheets I talked about. Um, so for us, pile weight, number of stitches per meter squared, the backing material, the tough withdrawal strength and the durability were the key ones for us. The figures in the bracket there um, show you the kind of range um, of carpets we were looking at. So they show you the range that different com companies were pitching to us with. Um, we did set a, a minimum standard and I think that's important because um, if I'm honest, our procurement team would just go with the cheapest solution um, if we left it to them and we'd probably end up with the sort of carpet you find in a green grocers. So we had to set some minimum standards just to make sure we were getting a quality product. And then obviously some variations within that that we could then justify based on kind of resilience and durability. And I think the, the last point there about durability and asking the company about how long they'll guarantee the pitch will continue to pass its IRB and FIFA testing gives you a sense of that durability uh, and how long it will last for. Um, other things we thought about considering um, were things like surface friction and skin abrasion. Um, we were very conscious that there was a, a, a 3G pitch that, that um, was installed in Glasgow, um, Glasgow Warriors Scots team pitch, and it got a lot of bad press around um, skin abrasion and the burns that players were getting from playing on it, um, even though it passed the World Rugby testing protocols. Um, so we considered looking at that. Um, Infield splash, another one, so how much of your rubber crumb bounces up out of the carpet. Um, there's something called a lie sport test, which is where they basically wear down the pitch to the point of destruction. Um, and you can get a score for that. So that gives you a sense of that durability. And then a UV stabilizer score as well. And these are all standards within the uh, FIFA document. The only slight problem with those is that they have a minimum standard. So you only have to achieve a minimum value to pass the FIFA test. So some companies take it as far as they can and you'll get a maximal score from them. Others just take it as far as they need to, to get the FIFA standard. So you don't always get an accurate comparison with that. So that's my only word of caution in that space. So that helped us kind of narrow down the carpet we wanted. Um, the next decision we had was around the infill. Um, and the University uh, of Nottingham um, has very strong environmental credentials. It's something that's very important to our, our university community and our students. So the issue of infill was quite, um, uh, quite a, a, a big debate we had really, because we're very conscious that at the moment um, there's some European regulation that's going through around banning microplastics um, across a range of products, but it, it actually includes rubber crumb in pitches. And I think Holland have actually already introduced a ban um, of the use of rubber crumb in their pitches. Um, I think the European regulations um, are due for a decision very soon. And if it goes ahead, I think the proposal is to introduce a ban within the next six years. Um, so we were conscious of you know, what implications that may have longer term. So we started looking at alternatives to rubber crumb and what we could put in. 
And I, I think we found that, that probably the best alternative is, is cork. Um, and actually there's a number of uh, places in the UK that have installed cork as their infill. Um, so Exeter City, uh, Newmarket uh, Football Club, um, there's a pitch down in Hampton and Middlesex. Um, but if you look at the, the table that I've shown on there, which is kind of produced by Labo Sport, um, you get a sense of the performance characteristics of, of rubber crumb versus cork. Um, and as you can see, the kind of five star rating for kind of the rubber crumb um, outperforms the, uh, the cork by a long way. I think there's still a lot of work to do in terms of those alternative infills. So it wasn't really something we're prepared to take a, a leap of faith on. The other thing we did was we did a costing exercise um, and over a, the lifespan of a, a carpet, which is kind of about eight to 10 years, cork was about a quarter of a million pounds more expensive than rubber crumb based on the upfront cost, the maintenance, and then also the infill replacement you would need to do. And we just couldn't justify that cost either. Um, but it'd be interesting to see if the European regulations do come in, um, the extent to which it kind of tunes people's attention and they start to work on better alternatives, but, but up till now, um, I'm not sure they're there. If you want the kind of performance characteristics um, from the pitch, rubber crumb is probably your best option. Um, so as we weren't gonna go with a, a different infill, we wanted to look at how we'd actually contain the infill and try and keep it within the pitch. So the high tough density I've talked about before in the specification um, is a good way of keeping the infill there. Um, traps around the entrances. So rather embarrassingly, the picture on the left with the blue bit of carpet was the entrance to our pitch. So we didn't have any sort of traps at the entrance to catch that infill. The picture in the middle is the new grating we've put in that will allow us to do that. Um, we put a perimeter curb stone around the edge of the pitch, again, to try and stop the rubber crumb just washing through, blowing through, bouncing through the, the fence line. And then just outside the fence, the mowing strip we've got is graded. So it slows back down into the pitch to allow us to kind of brush any rubber crumb that does start to leach from the pitch back onto the pitch surface. Um, one of the other things in terms of our process, and obviously we, we chose SIS for our, our project, um, was their environmental credentials. They were very good at guiding us through some of the challenges we had. We did talk to them about the cork options, um, but they've also um, started some interesting work around recycling carpets. So with our our carpet and our rubber crumb, they're looking to recycle it. They're looking to clean the rubber crumb um, so they can use it again. And I think that again, helped us with our decision-making around which company to choose. Other elements around environmental considerations were around lighting. Um, and again, this is where SIS were very good. You know, we weren't having to deal with lots of different suppliers. We just dealt with SIS and they actually managed the whole project for us. But obviously we talked about the need to replace our, our old lighting system with LED lights. Part of that was around savings, and I've, I've shared on the screen uh, the financial savings that we calculated we can make on our lighting system. Um, and also there's a, a reduction in um, carbon emissions as well, which again fitted with that environmental sustainability that we were trying to drive. The other advantage of the, the LED lighting was actually around uh, the lux levels and the flexibility we could go to. When we designed our pitch originally, it was a football rugby pitch. And for football rugby, you only need about 200 lux. Um, but sports like baseball, softball, lacrosse, were now starting to be played on the pitch. And certainly for baseball, softball, um, you need 500 lux uh, to play those sports and 3G pitches. Um, lacrosse is a really interesting one. Um, lacrosse don't specify a lux level. Um, I think, to be honest, because they're afraid that if they did, um, the majority of their activity occurs on football rugby pitches, 3G pitches, and if they specified 500 lux, um, it would cull most of their activity immediately. Um, but if you look at most sports with small, hard, fast balls that fly around, so baseball, softball, uh, hockey, um, they are spe specifying 350 to 500 lux. So it'd be very interesting if there was ever a test case where someone was injured uh, with a lacrosse ball at 200 lux, whether people could make a case that the light levels were not sufficient for that sport. But that's perhaps a, another debate for another time. Um, and then lastly, just some other things we considered as, as part of our project. Um, fencing. Um, so again, lacrosse is a bit of a nuisance of a sport in some ways, because one of the things we found with lacrosse was that if you fire a lacrosse ball hard enough, um, 
the ball will actually go through what is called super rebound fence. So most companies will specify for you a, a super rebound fence, which has apertures of about 50 mil by 60 mil. But as you fire a lacrosse ball really hard, the rubber morphs and the ball can actually go through the fence. So we actually had to specify a, a, a denser type of twin bar um, where the gaps were only 50 mil by 33 mil. So if you're putting in a pitch and you're doing fencing and you're thinking about the cross on the pitch, that'll be something to consider. Um, again, some embarrassing pictures for us on, um, on the slide. Um, the pictures at the top was actually the surround of our pitch and the inside of our pitch. So as you can see, um, we were starting to get contamination um, on our pitch from nice shrubbery that our ground staff put around the outside to try and make our pitch look attractive. Um, but it really doesn't help. So as part of the project, we put a mowing strip around the outside of the pitch to give it that bit of protection. Um, then in terms of uh, the digital solutions, um, I think we're always very keen to drive up spectators um, as part of our you know, aim to get people active. Um, so we put in uh, a PA system and a digital scoreboard, and we also put in some cameras, both for video analysis, but also to allow us to do live streaming which we think particularly in this COVID environment, live streaming is gonna be a really interesting opportunity for us to kind of raise profile and reach more people, particularly if we can't have big crowds present at the moment. Um, the picture on the bottom left is from the University of West England, a lovely dugout that they built. Um, we couldn't afford their expensive dugouts, but we've done something similar and actually having storage behind the dugouts is something that we thought was a really good idea um, to help with kind of clubs and kit. And then finally, last couple of bits, off cuts, uh, it's always worth keeping off cuts from the pitch, just in case you ever need to do any repairs in the future. If you ever have any issues of failure in the pitch and you need to test bits, to save you cutting out bits of your pitch, you can use those bits of off cuts. And sometimes you can use them to lay over muddy areas, again, to give you a bit of extra protection. Um, in terms of goals, there's some really nice new 4G goals, called 4G 360 goals from Harrods. I'm not on commission, I promise you, but they move in a 360 direction rather than moving up and down in straight lines and are well worth looking out for if you're getting new goals. Um, and then lastly, just think about life cycle costs. Just don't forget about them. I think people often forget about the top up rubber cost. It's about 10 grand every three years. And then the testing to keep your FA and your IRB testing cycles going is about two grand for every test. And unfortunately they don't align. So one is every two years, one is every three years, which is a complete nonsense if you ask me. Um, but again, that can quickly add up the cost. So just to finish, it's been great working with SIS. They, they were a one-stop solution for all of this. They've sorted the dugout design for us. They sorted out the lighting. They found a really good supplier for our scoreboards. They found a supplier for the camera. So we were just dealing with one person and it made it very, very easy for us. So there you go. I'm delighted to answer any questions at the end. Thank you very much for that, Dan. I think um, no doubt that was incredibly useful for everyone listening. So thank you for sharing your personal experiences with us. Um, there is actually a poll at this point uh, for all the attendees. So it's going to pop up on screen. And the question is, let's just cover that up. Are you confident in your plans to reopen facilities when restrictions lift? So we'd just like to get some insight from all of you uh, as attendees as to your current feelings in the landscape at the moment. Um, thank you again, Dan. Uh, and then our kind of last uh, uh, guest to invite up is Mark, Head of Infrastructure at Loughborough University. Welcome, Mark. Thank Good you. afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. So we're going to do things a little bit differently for this uh, session. I've, I've got a few questions for you. So we're going to go back and forward for a few, min few minutes now and hopefully delve into, I guess, the experiences from your perspective uh, at Loughborough University and um, the developments you've driven forward there over the last few years. So first of all, Mark, could you tell us about the outdoor sports facilities you have on campus at the moment? Yeah, we've, um, we're very fortunate, as you can see from some of the images that are about to come up, we've got quite a large campus. Um, we've got six artificial turfs and two football, one rugby one water-based hockey pitch, uh, one hockey and lacrosse, and an American football and football surface. Um, on top of that, we recently invested in uh, an SIS or Syscrass surface going into our stadium. Um, we have an indoor cricket centre and a stitched cricket wicket outside, as well as an indoor athletics and outdoor athletics track. Um, and then on top of that, we've got a number of multi-use games areas and an active landscape. So, yeah, very fortunate in terms of what we've got, but obviously that comes with then the challenges of maintaining and uh, keeping that going. 
Thanks for that, Mark. I mean, Loughborough seems to be constantly striving to add and improve to its sports facilities. Would you mind sharing why that is? Um, yeah, some of it, I think most of us on, on, on the webinar would recognise that sport, what, what sport can bring to a university and um, the part that it plays in the student experience. And, and critically for us, that's also a good, good revenue stream um, to the university. We're, we're very fortunate that sport is a fourth pillar um, so whilst most people are teaching research and enterprise, um, we have a, a fourth pillar in, in sport and therefore have a sports strategy and a capital plan that goes alongside that to try and continue to drive it. Um, but it does add into that student delivery and that, that greater uh, establishment of, of return on commercial. And as I just mentioned then at the end of Dan's presentation, I think people found his you know, personal experiences incredibly valuable. Would you mind telling us about why you you use SIS pitches and the relationship you have with them? Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I, I would echo what, what Dan's just said um, and also um, some of the stuff that, that Joe mentioned earlier on. We, we started working with SIS pitches back in 2015. Um, the first service that they did with us was our first 15 rugby pitch. Um, and to be honest, um, the experience that we received from end-to-end um, -end delivery from start to finish from Joe, um, but I could talk about John, John Turnbull, one of the site supervisors who's developed in the organisation, or even George Mullen, the CEO, um, was just out of this world. Uh, attention to detail, great communication, um, really care about what they deliver and how they deliver it to the point that, you know, it's a, hopefully, and Joe would probably echo this, a, a zero snags return when they complete a project. Um, and even if there are the odd one of the two things, they're on it straight away to be able to deliver it. So I think from our point of view, um, it, it's that that rapport. And I think critically um, having that relationship and that partnership is, is really, really important. And knowing that I could pick up the phone at any time, despite the facility being in five years um, and have a conversation around actually, how can, I, how can I do X, Y, or Z, or how can I improve this? Or what can I do to elongate the process? they come with a very honest conversation rather than a sales conversation, which for me is, uh, I'm, I'm not one for a sales, for sales technique on it, if I'm honest. It sounds very solution focused uh, as an approach. So uh, I can see where that would be really beneficial and, and positive. What other developments have you worked on uh, with them? Um, so SIS have been fortunate to win um, through tender. And I, I, I do stress that, that, that um, whilst, um, you know, we, we all have our procurement responsibilities and rules that we have to go through. So we have to go through a tender process um, and SIS have won, the, won those in the last five of us. So we've done recently the water-based hockey pitch, the stadium football pitch, um, a 4G was uh, on site, as well as uh, the multi-use games area and the, and the other pitch that we talked about earlier. Oh, fantastic. So lots, lots of examples there that I'm sure if people have got questions on, we can go into a bit more detail on at the end. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the hockey in the stadium development specifically? Yeah, there, those two in particular were um, interesting um, conversations and, and, and developments. We, um, I think critically for, for, as we've just explained, having a contractor you can trust in and have confidence in is, is really, really important. Um, and to this end, I think I'll start with the tender process. You, know, you can go into the detail that Dan talked about earlier in terms of um, the tender and absolutely right to do so and, and have those things. But I think also the valuation of how you value the tender process and understand what they've done previously as an organization and the weighting that you put on that is really important to us at the university. Um, the hockey pitch is there in front of you. So um, the hockey pitch is one where um, we've had previous suppliers um, who have been very, very good, but the, the team felt that the latest uh, Olympic surface was um, very much um, too hard um, and too bouncy in terms of, too, too hard on the knees in terms of training, but also the, the ball bounced quite a lot for, for the players. So we, we engaged with SIS to say, you know, what services do you have and, and what's possible? And, and actually, this is what our coaches and, and athletes are looking for. Whilst I couldn't give you the exact filament infill or detox rates or any of those sort of things, what we can do is what the, the athletes and players are looking for. And is that something we can work with you on? So they very, very quickly created a surface for us that um, answered those needs. Now, for us, that's then quite a risk 
Um, it's a new surface. It's not been in. We couldn't go and play on it. It's been tested to World Hockey Federation standards. Fantastic. It passes those tests. But we've got no feedback necessarily. So the conversation we had with those guys was very much, okay, so what if it goes wrong? And George stepped in as the CEO and very quickly answered the question of, if it goes wrong, we put it right for you. Um, and that's built up off, off years of reputation and conversation and, and discussions that when I looked at him and he said that to me, I kind of know that that's what he means and that's what he'll do. Now, we were fortunate. It didn't go wrong. The, the athletes, the coaches love it. We've given that feedback back to SIS and certainly England hockey and the, the underage groups that we have on site have, have thought it's phenomenal. Um, but it also saved us quite a, a bit of money compared to the Olympic standard service at the same time. So it's always worth having those conversations as to what you can get onto. The second I mean, one, sorry, Jenny. No, no, carry on, Mark. Sorry. The second one is the stadium pitch. So um, the stadium pitch is something that it, it's a massive to us. Those that have been to the, the campus know it's a, a 3,000 seat of capacity, 3,000 capacity, 200 odd seats um, that are in there, and a fantastic facility. But because it was grass, um, it has a finite resource and capability to it. So we could only play on it eight, eight, eight hours a week. Um, which means that for the majority of the time, it's actually sitting there empty. Um, so we, we engaged with uh, SIS and, and the guys around their hybrid surface, SIS Grass, uh, which gives, gives us three times more playability. And, and that results in us being able to attract the likes of UEFA, FA, Celtic um, during COVID, Nottingham Forest, Leicester City, Sheffield, Wednesday, Bolton, Port Vale, other football clubs that are out there. Um, to, to be able to utilise the surface as well as um, being able to utilise it for our students and everything else that's on there. And, and very much a commercial return scene on, on that particular pitch. It's really interesting some of the comments you've just made there, Mark, around, I guess, the, the partnership, the relationship you've developed with SIS pitches, and but it being underpinned by a very robust kind of process of tendering and making sure that, you know, um, any expectations are met and things are delivered on and anything that goes wrong is corrected. Uh, and you've also mentioned a few times around return on investment to the university. So I think another question would be, how do you convince the operations committee to invest in such facilities? Yeah, I'm sure that's a, a question that everybody's asking at the moment in terms of, um, especially with the financial situation with COVID and, and what's going on. I guess, um, first and foremost, the, um, there's no doubt having sport as a fourth pillar helps. Um, we obviously need a business case that stacks up. Um, our business case might be slightly different to some in the sense that it's not always financially driven. Um, although in some cases like the stadium pitch, there was a, a, a payback within seven and a half years, 100K uh, income stream, which we have to hit. Um, but I think very much it's how, how do we, how do we recognize what the power of sport is to the university? We're, we're fortunate that circa 75% of students that come to our university um, Put sport as a significant or very significant reason as to why they come. So clearly that has a natural return on investment to the university in terms of nine on £9,250 worth of fees coming in. Um, and we try and use that as much as we can, but also show how we can maximise the facility. And an example of that is the latest artificial turf where we converted a grass pitch, which, as I said before, we can only get eight hours out of, which generally costs us about £125 an hour to maintain. Um, to an artificial that is only £11 an hour to maintain and we can use 80 hours a week. Um, clearly we can get more out of that, whether that's commercial return, whether it's student use, et cetera. So I think ultimately it is about that, it's about how cost effective it is over the whole period and the lifespan of the product um, that's gonna be in, but how much is it giving back to the student population, the, the on-site uh, users that we have, whether that be national governing bodies or whoever. And I'm sure people listening in are, are really interested in that kind of student engagement and commercial return piece. Is there anything else you can kind of share on that in terms of the, the motivators and, and such behind the decisions you're making? Um, mainly that we, we have a very strict criteria. I think I mentioned earlier that we've got a sports capital plan um, that's been shared with our operations committee who are very much on board. It's been put into our estates management strategy in terms of what we're trying to achieve. So we know the target we're trying to do. Obviously, things like COVID can throw that um, out to kilt a little bit. Um, however, um, I think what we try and do is give confidence that we've already assessed the project that it's going to achieve on one of our four criteria, um, whether that be student experience, whether that be return on investment, 
enhancing our reputation are all part of those things. If it doesn't hit some of those criteria, um, we don't even put it forward. And, and some of that is about building confidence with the operations committee and the chief operating officers and the various people that make the decisions making process. But then on, on top of that, we our, our target during term time is very much student use. So we don't try and um, uh, bring in commercial return during that period of time because that goes against what we, we are as a university. However, in our term time, we have a sales team, a commercial team that will drive and try and sweat the asset as much as possible um, and bring in as many events, commercial bookings, whatever it may be, to make sure that it returns as quickly as it can. And I guess it's all full circle, really, isn't it? Because that success then leads into future developments and continuing that journey on for, for many years to come. Thank you very much for sharing that, Mark. Um, that was really interesting and but don't go anywhere because uh, I'm going to welcome Dan and Joe uh, back onto the screens as well and we'll move into the, the final Q&A section. Um, I've seen a lot of questions coming in in the Q&A channel so thank you for everyone that's been submitting those. We're going to kick off with a couple of the ones that were submitted uh, as part of registration and then we'll go into uh, the Q&A channel and pick some out of that. So first of all, I think we'll start with a question for you, Dan. Um, as a director of sport, would you prefer to have more elite athletes train at your institution or more community clubs? Uh, probably a different answer to Mark. If Mark's got loads, if Mark can lend me some of his elite athletes, that'd be great. Um, it, it's got to be a balance. I think the, the elite athletes provide the inspiration um, and, and inspire people. But at the end of the day, we want to get more people active and more people participating. And I think we recognise, you know, our wider role in the community as well. And I think COVID has, has exacerbated that with some of the tensions between kind of students and the local community. So um, it, it needs to be a balance. Um, yes, we'd like a few more elite athletes, but I think we've got capacity as well. I think that's the interesting piece is that everyone generally wants the same time. You know, everyone wants that kind of slot from kind of four or five o'clock through to closure. Um, and it's kind of trying to be creative to find people that will fill your daytime slots when you're a lot quieter and actually elite athletes sometimes fit into that quite nicely um, because actually they're professional, um, they're full time, they're not necessarily working, um, you know, they're, they're committed to their sport and actually you slot them in there. So a balance. So interesting then. So it's less about, I guess, uh, um, capacity that like you're saying there is capacity there it's more striking that balance right in terms of having both in and using the facilities and maximizing that capacity so thank you for that Dan. that's really interesting um mark what facility software uh, what facility management software do you use and and how do you charge for student club facility hire um so we use a, a system called gladstone which i think people are probably aware of that are out there however i would say that we're about to go through a tender process so that could change um we're, we're having a look at that and seeing what's the the best system out there that we can utilize um i think in terms of higher to student clubs I taught then about we we do things slightly different we, we don't actually charge student clubs so our athletic union clubs don't get charged for the space that they have um, we give away around about 1.5 million pounds worth of uh, student use to our, our students because we see the significance of what it does for them. Um, so I guess the answer is we don't. Um, however, if somebody wants to book it casually, etc., that's slightly different. Um, what we do try and do is a return um, against against um, outside of those things. So. Um, go to Dan's point a, a little bit around NGBs. I, I, we have a number of national community partners community body partners on site, um, we always try and ensure that they utilize the facilities during the day so that the students can maximize it during the evening. We would not um, dream of trying to entertain the thought of kicking out the students of an evening when that's their time to be able to utilize it for a national community body partner. That doesn't sit very well with us. And the balance is always difficult. I know James has asked a question around how you balance those things. It's a juggling act and, and it's very, very difficult to do. Um, and, and the team do a, a, a very good job at, at doing those things. But sometimes we have to make judgment calls and there is the odd occasion where there's a commercial venture that is worth doing um, and taking out the student use and there's the odd occasion when it's not worth doing. And, and I guess we, we balance that off depending on the need. That's really interesting as well, yeah. It's all about balance, right? Trying to get it right. And I'm sure there's this feedback when it doesn't quite go so right to keep you uh, <laughs> on the right path. Um, Joe, question for you then. What is the future when the rubber crumb ban comes in? And what is your view on rubber crumb versus cork? Just a nice, easy one uh, to start you off. 
one. Um, so at the moment we still think, well, officially it's still an if, although we think it's very likely um, that there will be something that happens in the next few years. So at the moment, all um, our new installations tend to have infill mitigation or infill barriers where to stop the uh, rubber infill going off the pitches. In terms of um, future, um, and to, we, we've been looking at various systems, um, as Dan mentioned, cork, um, there's coconut, um, and there's a few others, which a lot of the companies are keeping close to their chests, because you can imagine it's a bit of a race to the finish line. Um, but the difficulty is, is marrying the um, performance requirements, because at the moment, SBR rubber's um, really good on performance, um, and is really good in terms of its playing characteristics, comfort, um, so trying to get the cork and coconut to match that and um, that performance requirement whilst still keeping the costs the same because um, they're not as cost effective at the moment and the maintenance costs as Dan mentioned in term, in the example of cork uh, are quite high and um, so it can put um, the, the skids on things if, and it makes things more difficult um, when you're working to a budget. And I think some of what you've said there probably relates a little bit to this next question. And we've had a few people actually ask about hockey as a sport. Um, and one of the questions uh, kind of laid out, you know, hockey has lost out as a sport with the advent of rubber crumb pitches as facilities try to service the larger football and rugby markets. Are there any services that can accommodate both uh, and can be uh, endorsed for playing fixtures on? Um there is, but they, there's various categories of, of hockey um, performance. So, for example, um, for a major hockey club, they might have FA, FIH National, uh, whereas um, some of the uh, lower performance standard carpets can get you um, multi-sport level, which is sort of schools and, and, and general play. So there is a couple of uh, 3G products on the market, but they're by no means... Um, hockey specific, um, it's sort of you can play hockey on them, but only to a low level and they only meet a multi-sport standard. So um, the difficulty is commercially, it tends to be football that dominates, um, renting out and rentals. So that's why a lot of um, pitches are being converted from hockey to to, uh, to football, which is, which is unfortunate generally. So there was a few years ago, a big move to make everything multi-sport. But then you had um, hockey players complaining about the rubber crumb and footballers complaining it was it was too flat. So it's yeah, it's difficult it's difficult to achieve a, a good standard um, for for both systems uh, for both sports. Sorry. Thanks for that, Joe. The next question is again a, a bit of a natural progression here, and I'm going to direct this to to Mark and Dan. But maybe if you can answer first, Mark, do you see a future for grass pitches when it comes to university sport? Oh, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, so I'm a purist. I like I like to play on grass, you know, especially when it comes to football, rugby, etc. Um, but I, I think there are there there are certain benefits to artificial turfs um, in terms of what you can get out of them, and you, we, we're seeing that as uh, Joe alluded to earlier, Saracens and others that have done uh, services where they can then do development of. Uh, youth players and, and uh, even age groups training before matches, etc. Um, yeah, I, I can't see I can't see football moving too far away from it. Whilst we can do books, university sport on on an artificial turf, I think um, certain sports will want to keep the tradition. Um, but who knows? I think it's watch the space. What I would say is that to have artificials isn't you know. It's cost effective because of the hours that you can get out of it. It doesn't mean it's cheaper necessarily to do. So you have to balance the two. Thank you, Mark. Dan? Uh, yeah, it's interesting. You know, I think I think the hybrid space is one to, that's really interesting. And, and, and Mark's hybrid cricket pitch at, at Loughborough in particular, I think is an interesting kind of route to go down um, because I think you can get the best of both worlds. Uh, I think one of the things that, hasn't been properly looked into is actually the long-term impact of injury from playing on synthetic pitches because you don't get the same give um, when you twist and turn that you get from a grass pitch if you turn on a grass pitch you just rip the roots out you rip the grass out that doesn't happen on a on a synthetic pitch and I think there's some implications for people that train a lot and play a lot on synthetic pitches in terms of can knee and ligament damage 
um, that I think that research will, will start to throw up that might cause a slight reversal and slight concern about that. So um, my view is, is yes, I think 3G pitch is great for training, great for kind of weather implications and so on, but there will still be a need for grass pitches. Fantastic. And I'm going to stay with both of you for the next this next question. And then I'm going to fit one in at the end, Joe, which is a real good one to finish on. So uh, I'm not going to tell you which one it is, but you <laughs> prepare yourself. Uh, Dan and Mark, pitch dividers, do they work properly? <laughs> rubbish. They're rubbish. Sorry. Sorry, Joe, if I'm doing you out some money. Um, I, I haven't found a decent pitch divider. I think the problem is you, if you they don't pull across very easily to start with. Um, if you weigh them down with stuff, people run into them and then they kind of pull off the carabiners that connect them at the top. If you don't weigh them down properly, when the wind blows, the balls just go underneath them. Um, so I think they're a waste of money. And I think when I've seen people play, they just accept the fact that once in a while, a ball ends up on their pitch and they just kick it back when it's not important. And generally, you kind of use them for kind of seven aside, which although it's competitive, is arguably a bit more recreational. So the impact of kind of balls going on other pitches is, is less of a problem. So uh, personally, I wouldn't waste your money because I've not found a good solution. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd echo that. We, we don't have them on site. So it uh, probably says everything to us. It's uh, a maintenance cost that gets broken and damaged um, that you could do without. And, and ultimately, I agree with Dan that most people probably would, would accept, especially on seven-side football, five-side football, whatever, that if the ball rolls over, it rolls over and they can manage it accordingly. But we, we don't use them. But... It's just our take to it. You know, everybody has their different means. They might accept the ball rolling over. I don't know if they'll be as quick to accept your comment down around it being more recreational and less competitive, but uh, I'll leave the uh, yeah. <laughs> seven side players to pick that up with you separately. So, uh, Joe, last question for you. No pressure here. What is the next big thing currently in the pipeline that we should be excited about? Well, it's a secret, isn't it? No. Um, so... <laughs> We're looking at various things in terms of recyclable, recycling pitches. Um, again, it's that the, the, the industry itself is in, in the sort of race to, to come up with a viable um, cost effective solution for that. And I think that ties in with the infill as well. I think we're all um, both together as an industry, as well as individually as companies, looking at various ways which we can uh, solve that issue, because I think it is coming down the road. And the recycling uh, aspect is another one. Um, so at the moment, pitches can be recycled and there's a hierarchy, whether it be reuse, um, fully recycle or cleaning of infill and things like that. But again, the, the issue is it's a cost implication that wasn't there before. So it's, that's why it's important to work with clients like Dan and Mark to try and figure out a solution that, that will work economically, but also... Um, has that fully complete journey that although you're putting um, a man-made facility in the ground that a few years down the line that is reused recycled in some way as opposed to just going to landfill so I think there'll be something big coming up in in that front um, whether it be uh, infill uh, fully recyclable materials or even non-infill turf that could be the next next big thing. Well, I uh, thank you for a great answer, having been put very much on the spot there. So I appreciate that. And it is exciting. So thanks for sharing that, Joe. Um, OK, well, all that's left for me to do, and we're bang on three o'clock, is to say thank you again to each of you as panellists uh, for contributing today. Thank you as well to everyone who has submitted questions, additional questions on the Q&A channel that we haven't got around to answering. I promise you we will do that as a bit of a follow up afterwards. And a special thank you, of course, um, to yourself joe and sis pitches for helping us pull this uh, together today it's been a really useful webinar i think for everyone who has tuned in attendees just before you all run off there are a couple of polls still to go and we'll kind of spread them out 30 seconds apart for you to answer first of all are you planning to build new facilities over the next two years so you'll have about 30 seconds to answer that and then the last poll will ask you you know on a scale of one to five how valuable was this event you know have you enjoyed it today but thanks again everyone for tuning in and to our panelists and we'll hopefully see you on the next webinar thanks everyone
Okay, you're all good to speak again now. <laughs> it just took a while to remove uh, some hangers on. <laughs> well done, guys. I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, well done. Everybody. You guys are so like relief, Joe. You're like, oh, it's done now. Bit. I find it a bit weird, sort of chat talking, and then you can't see anything. Yeah, it's really very strange. Like I was just expecting someone to be message being like, "Your microphone's not on." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There was a reason why I wanted it as a Q and A. It felt more uh, natural for me, Jenny. So thank you, Jenny. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, thanks, right. Jenny. And Dan and Mark, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. really good really good stuff i thought all the presentations and the q a and the discussions um were really good well done as well to responding to some of those questions all of you and for giving very honest answers <laughs> to some of them and um, there was loads there was loads of questions so i think um joe will pick it up with you and enjoy uh, jordan and whoever else to kind of get some of those um answers to people because i think yeah, there was a lot of people wanted to know more about. So thank you for all your thought provoking presentations and, and answers. Uh, we've got a bit of work to do, more so than any of the other webinars, I would say there was a lot. Yeah, asked. this is definitely the webinar that we've had the most questions and that just goes to show how engaging um, all the presentations were. Um, we'll make sure that we answer a few of them as well, the more kind of general ones um, in the post event email that will go out. Um, but yeah, the the amount of questions just goes to show um, how engaged everyone was. And even at the end, there were still 100 people on, um, which just shows the uh, strength of it. So well done. I've already had an email from um, Greg Unwin at uh, Sheffield saying, can I have a copy of the video to share it with senior managers? So, Amazing. Tell her yeah. it will be in her inbox tomorrow. I'm not sure if you said her or him. Um, <laughs> him. <laughs> No, and special mention for your background, Dan, in the uh, in the chat there. Um, I was trying to work where that is, Dan. What is that? It's actually a, a Lowry painting uh, of a or a sketch of a football match. Um, so nice. I, I like my Lowry paintings, to be honest. And I was trying to find something sporty themed, so that one came <laughs> field. I mean, not making it social distancing there, but look at it. <laughs> no, well, back to better times, right? We could be near each other. Yeah. But um, yeah, thank you all very much. And I'm sure Georgie, Lars and others will be um, in touch. But yeah, brilliant. Brilliant job all around. Well done. Thanks, guys. Good to see everybody. Thanks, everyone. Well done, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Speak guys. Cheers. Thanks. Bye.